So Alicia, you know, I mean, for us, you know, in America, I think that over the last four or five years, where you agree or disagree with uh, the U.S. Task Preventive Force for PSA screening, you know, we've been seeing an increase in the instance of these patients walking in the office with metastatic disease. So what is usually your approach to those patients when they walk into the office in, uh, in Chicago? Uh, absolutely. We've been seeing an increase. I, I agree. Um, and I think that up until ESMO 2019, and actually even after ESMO 2019, I have focused initially on defining whether this is high volume or low volume metastatic disease. In the Chartist study, it was defined as four or more bone metastases with at least one outside of the axial skeleton uh, or visceral metastases. And that more or less is the definition that's been applied in several groups, though of course latitude used a high risk definition instead of high volume. Um, but that definition, I think, was what helped me decide what systemic therapy I was going to offer to, to those patients. And certainly, um, based on the charted data at least, it suggested that there was more of a benefit in the high volume metastatic patient population for, for docetaxel um, than, than for docetaxel use in the low volume metastatic setting. Additionally, of course, we know that radiation may be helpful for men with low volume metastatic disease radiation to the primary. So that's kind of how I was thinking about it. But surprisingly, perhaps, at ESMO 2019, we saw stampede data that was reevaluated by that high, vo low volume status. And they suggested that in their patient population, which notably was predominantly de novo metastatic rather than recurrent metastatic uh, hormone sensitive disease, there was actually no difference in, in outcome for patients treated with docetaxel, whether they were high or low volume. So now I'm still thinking about high and low volume uh, very much, but I'm also thinking about just as this patient, uh, we would recognize de novo metastatic versus not as I'm thinking about systemic therapy. So, so yeah, you know, you, you, you began by talking about the USPSTF controversy, and, you know, I think we all recognize now that we're starting to catch up with the rest of the world and the, our incidence of newly diagnosed prostate cancer. Our percentages of metastatic disease are going up, which is uh, unfortunate on a certain level. Um, you know, 5 to 30 percent of uh, European countries, pr patients present that way, and 30 to 60 percent of African, Middle Eastern, and parts of Asian countries, Latin American, present this way. Um, so it's an interesting phenomenon. And the comments that you made, Alicia, I think are really important about the recent stampede. Nick James presented this at ESMO just a couple of weeks ago, saying that, yeah, you know what, actually we're putting forward a different uh, thought process that low volume patients can benefit from ADT and docetaxel as opposed to what the charted long-term data says they could not. And there was this sort of rigid criteria, right? You know, four or more bone lesions, just kind of picked out of a hat, you know, and then one had to be axial, and you had, or you had to at least have an appendicular lesion as well as axial lesions and or a, a visceral metastasis. So I, I, I think I bring that up because you think of this globally now, how many patients present with metastatic disease this high volume, low volume has a certain arbitrariness to it depending upon the imaging that you use. And then we have the issue around, you know, tried and true use of docetaxel six cycles, which is, you know, fairly inexpensive, fairly uh, accessible and ubiquitous around the world. And now we're coming up front, we're confronting all the data that we're going to talk about now with oral therapies. And uh, is the survival, is the progression different, and the tolerability. So it's a, this is a great case to, to talk about.